Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Shaw? And Miss Wilbrand. Back at it again. Uh, we've got Triumphs of a Crusade. Uh, so we are going to go ahead and go through, uh, last week we did the first part of the Civil Rights Movement. We're going to get into kind of the nitty-gritty of the, what the Civil Rights Movement, uh, what happened during the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, you're going to hate it. It's really interesting, but it's just depressing. So yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. But we're gonna we're, we're gonna get this done in 20 minutes, or we're, we're at least we're at least gonna try. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, here are your objectives. I'm not really worried about these. You guys have access to these. We're gonna talk about strategies and then causes of some of the marches. Yep. Okay. Oh man, let me just. Uh, so first up, uh, we're talking about riding for freedom. So remember that we've had we're already kind of dealing with you know these these de these different segregations, the different uh, discrimination that's taking place um, and so freedom riders are a group of people that started actually going down south during uh, the summer of 1961 mostly it was mostly students and young people they actually just started going and riding these buses protesting some of the discrimination in the south and trying to challenge the segregated bus facilities uh, and so this is actually before the Montgomery bus boycott because this was uh, so this kind of the, the timeline's a little messed up, but anyway, so these buses were actually attacked. They were firebombed. You see them right here in the bottom right of your screen. And then the federal government stepped in, and then the Interstate Commerce Commission, which is a bureaucratic agency, you don't need to know that, don't worry about it, um, they prohibited segregation in interstate travel facilities. So again, side kind of a side thing with the Montgomery bus boycott, um, they now were, uh, now any interstate travel is also uh, segregation is also forbidden on there as well. Anything to add, Ms. Wilbur? Uh, yeah, uh, you guys have seen the ICC before. We saw it uh, when the government started regulating railroads back in the very late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, the ICC was established very tail end of the 1800s, if I remember correctly. Um, but remember, they still couldn't regulate railroads until the early 1900s. So we've seen the ICC before step in and and regulate interstate travel and interstate travel uh, modes of transportation. Um, so this is just them stepping in again and, and doing some more regulatory acts. So the, the government's getting more powerful. Federal yeah. government, excuse me. More, more on that later. More on that later. Go for uh, it, Ms. Wilbrand. Universities. Um, so Damn. this is an extension of Brown v. Board, uh, which was passed in the 50s. Um, so one of the first universities to be desegregated officially with a court case um, was Ole Miss, uh, the University of Mississippi. Um, the NAACP steps in, and remember they're established in 1909, so they've been fighting for equality for um, close to 50 years at this point. Uh, they step in and they help James Meredith uh, win a case against Ole Miss and uh, gets him admitted to uh, the university. The governor is uh, surprise, surprise, in Mississippi, a little racist, and refuses admittance um, to Meredith. Um, but Kennedy steps in and orders protection and forces the university to accept him anyway. Uh, and that uh, that protection is going to come in the form of the National Guard. Um, the first integration of an undergraduate university in the South is Ole Miss, with the help of James Meredith and President Kennedy. So. Um, I think it's important to note that Kennedy himself um, saw an opportunity for, uh, I don't know, ratings and um, general public positivity by supporting civil rights. I don't know that he necessarily supported it himself um, or not, but um, he did see that this is what America needed and without the support of Kennedy, uh, African Americans were going to continue to suffer, and we're going to talk about some violent things that happen here later on. Um, and so he's trying to help the good of the whole country here with this. And this is about eight years after, or so after Brown versus Board. So yeah. the, the the timeline is still here. Like that, even though the Supreme Court ordered that public schools, which again universities are not, even though they were ordered to be desegregated, that really hadn't rippled to other uh, areas of the country until until James Meredith gets accepted to all this. So, okay. Again, 
Education oh, sorry. is not a federal institution. It's a state institution. So. Uh, I forgot to unbold this, the first part. Oh, well. Um, okay. It's okay. Don't worry about the bolding, guys. It doesn't, it, it's, it. it's, it's randomly bolded. We apologize. All right, so some background. It, first of all, um, if you want to ignore the slide and then just go watch the movie Selma, uh, Miss Wilburn and I completely support that idea. Uh, because this it will it'll really run down everything you need to know for uh, for the violence in Birmingham. Anyway, Birmingham, Alabama is one of the strictest um, de fact or not sorry de jure segregations uh, areas in the country, and it was known for a lot of racial violence and just all kind all kinds of really bad stuff was any really bad discrimination was happening uh, in Birmingham. So. During this time, uh, white racists had bombed churches and civil rights gatherings 18 times just between 1957 and 1963. Martin Luther King, in response to this violence, he actually led a march in Birmingham and he was arrested. Did you know that he was arrested for not having a proper permit for a parade? Because you have That's the right all. to assemble, but you have to have proper permits from the state and local governments. So he knew he was going to get arrested. And so that was kind of what he was planning on in this case. And so in, once he was in jail, uh, he actually wrote one of his very famous letter from a Birmingham jail, which you'll probably read in government class, and um, tried to still, uh, basically, people started to see all this horrible stuff that was happening in Birmingham. Uh, this was all televised. And it, and again, I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but uh, I mean, there were children, guys, that were that were marching and protesting along with, um, you know, the adult civil rights leaders, and they were getting attacked by dogs and hosed down. As you can see here in these pictures, they were they were treated just like adults, and um, that was really what got a lot of moderate whites kind of like raising their eyebrows and and saying, "Hey, we cannot allow this to go on. This is ridiculous." Um, so this is kind of what again the the television, just like we saw with Vietnam. Uh, really played a large role in uh, in showing what was going on in Birmingham and getting the people aware and starting to care about uh, the plight of African Americans in America. Anything to add, Ms. Wilbrand? No, you did a great job. Next slide. Thank you. So we're already at seven and a half minutes. So. I know. We, we're, we're doing great. I believe in us. Panic. I'm trying not to panic. Uh, this is you. The March on Washington, <laughs> boys and girls, you have heard about the March on Washington before. I am certain of it. Um, in support of civil rights, Kennedy does send a civil rights bill uh, in 63 to Congress, um, but Congress refuses to debate it. Uh, we won't see a civil rights bill, and I'm jumping ahead of us now, we won't see that passed until after Kennedy's assassination, uh, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit, uh, the passing of the bill, not the assassination. Uh, Dr. King does organize a march on Washington. Um, you, I mean, there are lots and lots of marches on Washington. When people say March on Washington, this is the one they think about, but there's also been several women's marches and uh, marches for equality and lots of other things as well. So it's not uncommon to march on Washington. Um, it sends a bold statement to Congress and to the government. Um, and the purpose of it was to persuade Congress to pass Kennedy's Civil Rights Bill it does not persuade Congress. Um, this is a huge moment in history. Uh, Dr. King delivers his I have a dream speech, but nothing immediately really comes from it. Um, Congress really sits tight. He does deliver his speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial. You can see the National Mall right here, um, stretched out with all these people. When you watch the speech, if you look out into the crowd, you'll see African-Americans and whites gathered together in support of Dr. King and the march. So it's a pretty powerful moment in history. You're gonna actually watch that speech on a different day, so, for this lesson, so I'm not gonna go too in depth. Um, continue. You go and finish it up. Washington, the Civil Rights Act of 64 um, is signed by LBJ. Remember, he takes office after Kennedy uh, passes away, is assassinated. Um, but it's not for another year that uh, the bill is signed. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, religion, national origin, and gender in relation to the use of public accommodations. I know, and so you can't, yeah, like, again, now you, 
essentially you cannot be discriminated against in like looking for a job and in employment uh, or like if you want to go to a hotel or a restaurant like you cannot be discriminated against just they can't refuse service to you just because of the color of your skin or your gender all right 10 minutes are up we gotta we, we gotta go okay i was gonna say it's gonna strengthen and fortify all the other bills and laws that have been passed and all the decisions by the supreme court case so far like brown v. Board. But go on Perfect. All right, I'm going to keep our faces in the middle here. All right, so again, the fight for civil rights is going to be very, very intense here. Um, the movement needed, they knew that they needed more people to register to, to vote. So um, what they're going to do is like a bunch of student groups uh, led by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Congress on Racial Equality. They're going to begin registering thousands of people, especially in the South, to vote. Um, and a lot of people, again, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, I apologize, but they are going to be kind of frightened to vote. There's all, all kinds of things that are getting in the way of them voting, things like poll taxes, grandfather clauses, literacy tests, all kinds of stuff. And so this group of people, the, like, during the Freedom Summer, their main goal was just to register people to vote. And um, it's very, they actually faced re, um, really dangerous conditions. Um, from what racist whites and so this was a very brave thing to do uh, and they were able to uh, They were able, able to get a lot of people registered which are going to help uh, To pass some of these other laws and get pe more pe people who are going to be supportive of civil rights into Congress um, Later on so again, they're gonna face beatings murder arson in homes and churches all kinds of stuff Yep, um, including people burning things in their yard throwing things through their windows things like that Perfect. Oh no. Yeah, go for it. I don't know why it's not letting me move it. Oh well, I'm just gonna keep it over here. Continue. Okay. All right. Um, well, for some reason, mine's all weird now too. Okay, anyway. Um, the march in Selma, um, Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot and killed in Selma, Alabama. MLK organizes a 50 mile protest march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, and it ends at the state capitol building. Uh, this is on March 7th, 1965. The march starts. Police immediately attack um, the crowd. They begin beating uh, marchers using tear gas attack, uh, and attacking them with their dogs. Um, it's all televised, uh, just like we've been talking about. This is in people's living rooms for people to see. Um, and it really sparks some strong emotions that the public has about how the government is handling things, um, how local law enforcement is handling things as well. Uh, March 21st, 1965, March was set out again, but this time with federal protection. Um, it eventually leads to a whole bunch more people joining the march as well. So it grows in numbers once people realize it's safe. Um, or as safe as it can be to march because they're being protected by the federal government. Um, it is against the Constitution to not allow them uh, this march so long as they are being respectful and not um, blocking any traffic or doing anything like that. So uh, it was pretty unconstitutional for the police to immediately attack uh, these African American marchers. Um, and that's why it sparks such strong emotions and why the federal government stepped in. Basically, President Lyndon Johnson had decided that if he didn't support the march, uh, it was going to be very bad for him if, when he tried to go get reelected or get elected the first time, actually. But um, so that's why he did send in federal troops. Okay. And you have to remember, during this whole time, like the Vietnam War is happening and, and people are watching some other really terrible stuff going on as well. So um, they're seeing a lot of bad on their TV at this point. Correct. So uh, some other successes, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is going to strengthen voting rights for all Americans, but specifically for African Americans and minorities in the South and then in the West. Uh, it also is going to eliminate literacy tests. So that is a big, a big deal um, to get, act, finally get rid of. Now they cannot be discriminated against just because they have a lower level of education or if they have a lower level, level of education. The 24th Amendment is going to eliminate poll taxes. Now you no longer can be charged a fee in order to vote. And uh, these saw African-American voting triple by 1968. I'm sorry, Ms. Wolverine, I missed the fee. I'm so it's sorry. Okay. I'm trying not to cry. 
Um, and on literacy tests, I think I have a copy somewhere saved that I found once of the literacy tests for African Americans. I'll try and find that and we'll put it in the PowerPoint right here for you if I can. Um, I think it's important to know that not everybody had to take the literacy test. And even if you were pretty well educated as an African American citizen, uh, the literacy test was really confusing and kind of impossible. Um, and the purpose was to keep African Americans from voting. So. Yeah, then they could just whoever was in charge of registering people could just ask whatever questions they wanted to, yeah. you know, to keep you. It wasn't. It was definitely a, an, an illegal practice. Yeah. Oh, you didn't pass. Mm, bummer. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. these are our conclusions. I'm just going to go through it real quick, and you can start us out on the next one, Miss Wilbrand. Okay. So, um, new again, the, the the thing to take away here, guys, is that we have new leadership, strong leadership in the movement, and they are going to take more aggressive stances. In moving towards equality, um, things like Freedom Riders, the Freedom Summer, and other different and other marches that take place in the South and in the capital, Washington D.C., are going to expand and really get some key victories. Um, and the, in the 1960s, are actually a really good few years for the civil rights movement, seeing a lot of change. But is it enough? Do they have true equality? And unfortunately, the answer is no. And we'll see what happens afterwards. All right, so challenges and changes in the movement, lesson four. Here we go. Uh, pretty similar objectives. How and why did the civil rights movement split? And uh, list the successes of the civil rights movement. So we're going to see a divide in the civil rights movement here. All right, so seeking greater equality. Division within the civil rights movement. So in the late 60s, uh, there comes a time when the movement itself splits. It has grown to a pretty big number. Uh, and we see a division between older generations and younger generations within the movement. Older members believe that the system is working. Younger members do believe that it's working, but there have been too many compromises and progression is too slow. Um, there are more immediate society. Oh my gosh, I feel like I'm talking about right now. Um, <laughs> and they want things right then, uh, which is understandable because they're the ones in the workforce, in schools, living through it. Um, there is Northern segregation. The civil rights does move toward de facto segregation of the North, um, which remember de facto, that's how it's always been. So that's tradition. Um, so we do see some segregation and then moving toward desegregation as well. What you're gonna see guys is that older people tend to be more conservative and they that means that they don't wanna take as many risks. So like older people are gonna be like, hey, things are really great now. We've made, made all this progress. This is gonna be enough. Younger people are gonna be like, no, like we don't have everything we need yet. And you're, they're gonna to wanna to keep fighting. And what Ms. Wilbrand mentioned about it being very, very similar to today is there's very, a lot of young people now are trying to fight for things like, you know, free healthcare, um, you know, environmental protections, things like that. Whereas older generations don't want necessarily want to do that. Uh, and usually it just comes down to issues like taxes nowadays, unfortunately. Uh, but back then it really was more of a difference, difference of belief. Okay, so getting into some desegregation issues here. Sorry, don't really have a good spot to put us, Ms. Wilbrandt. There we go, that's gonna have to work. Um, so we've talked uh, a little bit about, we were talking about the Cold War at home. We talked about the suburbs and white flight. So remember when whites moved out of the cities, they take all their money with them. And now this, the urban areas are going to really start to deteriorate. Only poor people live there. The cities aren't going to be able to collect as many taxes. And so they're not going to be able to keep it up and keep it nice um, like it was when the people who had money were living there. So um, we're not, again, we're not going to cover, really go into any more about that. But the other thing you need to understand is that education is publicly funded. So when whites took all of their money and when they left, they are le taking with all, leaving with all their money. And now the schools that had relied on those, that, on that income, don't have, they don't have that money anymore to provide good ed educations for their kids. Again, like we in, in St. Peter's, Missouri are extremely fortunate to have wonderful educators like ourselves, um, but again, it, it, people like students in the city might not have not might not be as lucky, um, you know. And so that it, we're still kind of dealing with that issue now, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, I'm rambling. 
So job job problems in the cities and unemployment is going to be two times as high for African Americans. Again, remember there's not as many opportunities in the city sometimes as well. And then unfortunately, uh, police brutality is a really big problem uh, for because like a lot of, a lot of times what would happen is uh, the white the police forces would be white all white then they would actually live in the suburbs and then they would go to their jobs in the cities um, where they are just policing African Americans and they. Uh, are not going to be treating African Americans as fairly as they should be. Anything to add there? I went kind of fast, Ms. Wolfman. No, um, I mean, we're already at 20 minutes, but I just want to say that we see some of this reflected later in history too, and I'll kind of leave it there for now, but um, keep in mind that, that these ideas don't necessarily go away. They're not, their purpose, the de facto segregation idea isn't necessarily the underlying cause right now, but the the process doesn't really go away. So um, we mentioned in our last PowerPoint about de facto segregation kind of still happening here in St. Louis. Um, we didn't mean that it's because St. Louis by nature is a racist city. It's just that if you look at demographics of different areas, this is kind of what's happening still today. So, sure, uh, that's just how it's always, just, just how it's always been. Hence de facto. <laughs> Um, we, don't, we don't really need to go through all of these. Um, I will say that uh, we do have some, there are a ton of riots throughout um, throughout America during this time. Um, we don't need to go through all of them. I do want to say though, and we're going to talk about this later on as well, um, Los Angeles, the riot in Los Angeles is known as one of the worst riots in US history. Um, and it's not going to be the only time that LA sees um, a big scary riot. So um, 34 people are killed, hundreds of millions of dollars in property damage happened in LA. Um, there's a video for you on the Detroit riots in 67. Um, again, we're not going to go through all of them, but uh, you have access to this chart. So perfect. Again, these are just some of the uh, like the different riots that you'll see. And uh, again, nothing really to talk about, just some some images that you might see. Again, guys, this was a crazy time to be to be alive. Like in this, again, you, you picture Ferguson, uh, but Ferguson with like probably about times 10. Again, and I'm just throwing out a number there, but you're you're gonna be seeing a lot of a lot of issues, a lot of people dying, a lot of really scary times, especially if you live in the cities. Um, so intentions are high. Um, you want to talk about some new leaders arising? Did you want this one since I took the chart or do you want me to Sure thing. Well, I mean, you, it's up to you. I can take it. Okay, so new leaders arise. Um, and I, I really do enjoy talking about this just because this is a really, it's a really different turn uh, in the civil rights movement. So uh, a lot of people are unhappy. Like we, but basically by this time we have won, we've, we've had all these victories and we still don't have true equality. And so enter Malcolm X. Malcolm X is, a, is the other most powerful uh, figure of the civil rights movement besides Martin Luther King Jr. And um, he has a really unique story. Again, he actually spent 20 years in prison for burglary. Um, during that time, he studied uh, Islam, the religion Islam, uh, under Elijah Muhammad. Again, he actually joined uh, Elijah Muhammad's group called the Nation of Islam, and they were African-American Muslims. And they believed a couple of things. They want, believed that white society was the cause of all African American problems. African Americans should take control of their communities. They should not rely on on whites for anything anymore. And then they also are going to be in favor of using guns and violence to protect their new rights that they're going to be gaining. So if you remember Anything to add there? To when we were, yeah, if you remember back to when we were talking about Dr. King. Um, Dr. King doesn't necessarily, and his followers don't necessarily blame whites, they blame the, the tradition and the history in the United States. Uh, this is the way things always have been, but it's not right and we need to change it. Whereas Malcolm X gives people a specific group and face to blame, uh, which is white Americans, um, which fuels anger, uh, which is opposite of Dr. King's uh, belief system, which we'll talk about on the next slide. I think. And I think to just to kind of clarify, like I think that the Nation of Islam, are, like these are the beliefs of the Nation of Islam, and Malcolm X actually breaks away from the Nation of Islam because he thought that their ideas were too radical. Um, but and that is actually going to lead to his assassination, unfortunately. So 
let's go ahead and move on. Um, well, I can just go ahead and finish this one too, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, Malcolm X was given a lot of press coverage because of his more radical view. He was actually a fantastic speaker as well. He was hilarious. Um, like some of his speeches are just really a pleasure to watch because he's really, really smart and, and knows how to move a crowd. Um, and so he was, the, the, the thing about Malcolm X is that the armed self-defense position, like it, it scared a lot of white society and really most of white society. And so that that was where he and, and Martin Luther King really differed. And that was part of the reason why uh, he actually ended up breaking away from the Nation of Islam. But anyway, so this is the split in the civil rights movement. Is it okay to use violence to, in order to achieve our goals? So now we're our nonviolence of Martin Luther King versus the violence of Malcolm X. And so uh, Malcolm X is actually, he's going to break away from the, from the Nation of Islam because it's getting too radical. Uh, and then he is going to be assassinated by a Nation of Islam member in February of 1965. Uh, so, again, we're not going to really know what, it, what would have happened, but the violence is taken up by other other groups after he dies. And again, as we were talking about generations and things that change through generations, this is, I think, a reflect. Malcolm X, I think, is a good reflection of that change that happens um, between younger generations and older generations. As he got older, he himself got more conservative um, in his views and how things should be handled. So. Yeah, and I think I like to just like, you know, he, he's not talking about just violence for no reason. Like he's talking about violence in response to, you know, to violence. violence from racist whites, basically. Yeah. So, okay. Take it away, Ms. Wilgren. All right. So uh, a little bit more on the split. Um, so we do see the former um, SNCC and core members uh, believing in Malcolm X. Um, and his system, um, who believed it, that Dr. King was going slowly and, and peacefully, but too slowly. Uh, we see the Black Power Movement uh, rise up out of this, and that's a movement to promote Black goals, leadership, and pride in their culture. Uh, we also see the Black Panthers, which is another group that comes up out of this as well. Um, they're a group founded to fight police brutality in African American communities. Uh, note the word fight. Uh, they fight for full employment and decent housing. Uh, they do preach self-defense, um, so African Americans owning guns to defend themselves, which is where the violent side of this comes in. Where Again, we're not talking about going out and, and burning buildings down, we're talking about self-defense. Um, but they also are going to set up resources like daycares and food banks uh, for African Americans, which is really powerful and and some positivity that comes out of this group. Um, they do become a great source of fear among white society because again, the majority of news anchors and, and people that are portraying all this are white. And so they don't portray, hey, this happened to this group, this African-American group, and this is how they responded. They say things in their news stories like, this group burned this building down today, or they fired back at police with their guns. Um, so by omitting some of the truths, um, it builds that fear among whites as well. And all I was going to add there is just that you, I, I, you remember that when, when whites left the suburbs, there's really nothing there in, in, anymore. Like there's not enough resources to take care of the people that are, are remaining in the cities. So the Black Panther Party actually do, they, like when it talks about daycare and food banks, like they go a long way to helping to you know, kind of normalized life again in the city. Um, and I don't know if you remember a few years ago, Beyonce actually dressed up uh, and her and her, all of her dancers as black in Black Panther, like regalia. And she had a lot of flack for that just because um, a lot of people still associate it as like a violent part of the movement. But again, they the problem is, is that you're not talking about the right type of violence. You're talking about, you know, self-defense instead of just going and, you know, killing people for no reason. Um, so that's a really tough uh you know, we're kind of still seeing a little bit of misconstruation. I just made that up. I like it. Moving on. <laughs> um, is this one, is it me? Is it my turn? Okay. Okay, so uh, Martin Luther King obviously is going to disagree with the Black Power and the Black Panther movements. 
um, he believed that violence is going to do more harm than good because of that. Like if whites are scared, they're not going to support the movement. Um, so anyway, he had been the target of numerous death threats uh, because they believed that he was not really doing enough. Uh, and, and again, there's a still a lot of racist whites that don't like Martin Luther King. He is a very powerful figure. Um, and so anyway, uh, long story short, uh, April 1968, he gave a speech in support of a city employee strike. And, it, and actually in that speech, there was a lot of, he actually talked a lot about um, fearing for the end of his life. And then April 4th, which is a very important day, um, and very sad day because it's my birthday and I share a birthday with Martin Luther King's assassination. Anyway, I'm depressed now. Uh, so he was, uh, he was killed by James Earl Ray with a rifle, um, or he was shot uh, in the morning there uh, at his hotel and he died later that day. And the impact of this uh, being, besides, you know, being a really kind of a, a big, you know, uh, shot in the knee of the of the movement they're not going to really be as they don't have as 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 solid a figure to lead them anymore uh but there are just crazy race riots all over the all over the united states um in response to king's assassination and so uh that's really uh i mean really a big big problem but it's you just no no one would have ever fores foreseen that happening but it did anything to add there Thank you. you. Can, um, if you go to Memphis, uh, you can go to the motel where he was assassinated um, and see the balcony. So, cool. Um, powerful stuff. Um, here are some big moments in the movement we've kind of talked about already. So, you do have Brown v. Board, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 64, um, and then the one of 65 that elim eliminates the literacy tests for voting. Uh, then the 24th Amendment, which eliminates poll taxes, um, which are taxes on certain areas uh, that you have to pay in order to vote. Uh, then the Civil Rights Act of 68, then affirmative action, and then an increase in pride uh, in African-American history. So here's just a little timeline for you. I'm not going to go through it because we're already at 32 minutes. Um, <laughs> but you have uh, to this is supposed to be Voting Rights Act, so we're going to change. We'll change that in the PowerPoint. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, you're fine. So again, is no, you're fine. Is so is the movement movement successful? Um, they they got a lot done, but part of the issue is that uh, African Americans really don't have equal rights even today. And so, was it successful? Yes, but did it achieve achieve what it actually wanted to? Uh, that's probably a no. Um, so again, civil rights, that we talked about the split, we talked about the, the differences in, in the approaches between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Um, they were both assassinated um, because of their beliefs and people who disagreed with them. So there was dramatic gains, uh, but uh, there, there's still more to be done. Like Ms. Wilbrand said, I really like what she said earlier about how uh, this fight really hasn't ended. Um, we're still kind of talking about these same things uh, even today. And it's unfortunate that we still have to, but uh, it needs to be done. It's, uh, it's very different, just for an example, and we talk about this a lot in my government class, um, it's very different for me or Mr. Shaw uh, to get pulled over by a police officer than it is somebody um, in their early 20s who's Black to get pulled over by a police officer in St. Louis or um, even in, in rural areas as well, especially in a more conservative state such as Missouri. Um, and it's not something that you realize until you hear about it from people that you are close to. Um, sure. So I know that we say this fight isn't over and I know a lot of you probably are like, well, there aren't riots for African-Americans today. Like I hear you and they do have equality legally, but how much of that equality is actually, actually reflected in society is the big question that we want you to ask yourselves. And you are close to voting age and you are the next generation that will make changes. So it's up to you to make those changes. Well, and one thing I was gonna add here, just that the, yeah, we talk about African-Americans, but really it, it includes all minorities. You guys, next week, we're gonna, uh, Ms. Wilbur and I are gonna talk about um, the other Boy, fights. Oh, sorry, preview. Uh, talk about other, um, other civil rights movements. And, but like, even today, if you think about it, like, you know, I, I would say that a lot of the same things are happening with the Muslim community. 
and now there's a lot of fear, um, you know, and like getting, getting, I imagine being a, a, a Muslim person, you know, going through an airport now, you know, it's, so there's just a lot of, a lot of that same fear still exists, unfortunately. And that's, uh, they say that you, you never really, uh, like you, you always fear what you don't know. And that's part of the problem is that there's a lot of people that have just never had experiences with, uh, you know, people of other races. And that unfortunately is a, that is de facto segregation at its finest. And that kind of snowballs the problem. I think. Unintentionally, but ignorance is not always bliss. Sure. Guys, we've taken up way too much of your time, but this was so nice. So nice. We did, we did well. We did. <laughs> uh, hey guys, you're the best around. We love you. We'll see you next time. See you next time, guys. Bye.